nationwide protests and strikes which made clear that the Bengalis want what the Bengalis want, as well as their wholehearted support for Bangabang. The drive towards emancipation of the Bengali nation was, was thus started. The 1968 Agartala conspiracy case resulted in nationwide student movement and mass absurd, demanding the withdrawal of the case and the release of Bangabang. Upon his release from prison in, on February 22nd, 1969, people of Bangladesh bestowed Sheikh Mujib Rahman with the title Bangabandhu. The very next day, Bangabandhu declared that henceforth the then East Pakistan would be called Bangladesh. People quickly grasped Bangabandhu's earnestness for the country's independence and rallied behind him. Bangabandhu's unconditional love and affection for the country and its people was reciprocated by the masses in the general election of 1970, giving his party absolute majority, providing Bang Bangabandhu the mandate to work for their emancipation. Distinguished guests, suspension of the session of National Assembly on, Mar on 1st March 1971 inflamed the Bengalis and instantaneously resulted into massive demonstrations throughout the country. Bangabandhu's historic 7th March speech was a real declaration of independence. He called on his fellow countrymen to take all out preparations to fight for independence. He unwaveringly announced, and I quote, bear in mind since we have given blood, we will give more. By the grace of Allah, we will surely liberate the people of this country. The struggle this time is a struggle for our emancipation. The struggle this time is a struggle for our independence." Uh, unquote. The 7th March's address is not only the greatest speech in Bangla, Bangla language, it is one of the most poignant and powerful speeches in the history of the world and has duly been recognized as such by UNESCO. The speech continues to inspire freedom-loving peoples around the globe. Following the genocide of 25th March, Bangabandhu formally proclaimed the independence of Bangladesh in the early hours of March 26, 1971, and the war of liberation had begun. Every citizen of the country responded to the call of Bangabandhu, and I quote, this may be my last message. From today, Bangladesh is independent. I call upon the people of Bangladesh, wherever you might be, and with whatever you have, to resist the army of occupation to the last. And I unquote. Distinguished participants, after the nation's independence, Bangabandhu bravely faced the insurmountable challenges of rebuilding the infrastructure, resettling the huge number of refugees and internally displaced persons, resuscitating the war ravaged economy, and gaining international support. His prudent policies helped stabilize the economy during the early years and laid solid foundations for faster paced future growth. He had the constitution drafted in record time and garnered recognition for the new country from 126 states. His ideals, thoughts and visions helped the nation achieve a respectable place among the family of nations very soon. Bangladesh was born at the height of the Cold War and intense block politics in the international arena. Bangabandhu wanted to avoid getting sucked into the ideological rivalry by all means, as he wished to focus attention on economic development activities. He however knew it well that he could not remain isolated from what was happening around the world, as he commented in his unfinished memoirs, and I quote, as a man, what concerns mankind concerns me, and I unquote. He espoused a very pragmatic policy of friendship with all the countries of the world and decided to join the non-aligned movement so that a neutral, neutral foreign policy could be pursued. As, he has, as has been demonstrated in his speeches in the international forums, mm -hmm. Bangabandhu was firm in his opposition to colonialism, racism, and imperialism, and supported freedom struggles of peoples across the globe especially in South Africa and Palestine. 
Bangabandhu was always with the oppressed people of the world. As he traveled around the globe, he met the leaders of both the developed and the developing nations and transmitted the message of and transmitted the messages of peace, mutual respect, and shared prosperity. Bangabandhu's statesmanship earned him global accolades as the World Peace Council honored him with the Julio Puri Peace Award in 1973 for his extraordinary contribution to the causes of peace in the world and the oppressed people. Bangabandhu had a towering personality and the best compliment was perhaps paid by Fidel Castro of Cuba as he remarked, and I quote, I have not seen the Himalayas, but I have seen Sheikh Mujib. In personality and in courage, this man is the Himalayas. I have thus had the experience of witnessing the Himalayas. And I unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time now to listen to the distinguished presenters. And our first speaker today is Dr. Saeed Anwar Hussain, who does not need an introduction. Just to say that he is currently Bangabandhu Chair Professor at the Bangladesh University of Professionals. Over to you, Dr. Hussain. Sir. Okay. Distinguished and honorable chief guest of today's very significant session, Dr. A.K. Abdul Momen, Foreign Minister, Government of Bangladesh, special guest, Dr. Shamsul Alam, State Minister of Planning. Distinguished Chair of BISS, Ambassador Fazlul Karim, and dear Director General, Major General Imdadul Bari, NDC PSCTE, Dr. Atir Rahman, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, Slam Alaikum, and Good Morning. My paper concerns entirely with the emancipation of the Bagali people at home. No reference is, however, made to Bangabandhu's diplomatic debacles, and it is titled Bangabandhu, Bangladesh, and Bagali Emancipation. Ladies and gentlemen, I have traced the genesis of the independent entity of Bangladesh from the time of Shoshanko, who in 594 AD established the first Bangali independent kingdom at Gaur by repudiating the Gupta rule over Bengal. Shashanko was 100% Bangali. The next episode of Bangali's independence was provided by the Pala rule in Bengal between 750 AD through 1161. Let me reiterate here that Palas were sons of the soil like Shoshanko, and they, their kingdom earned Nish for respect and reverence throughout the subcontinent. The next episode of Bengal's independence was provided by the independent sultans of Bengal between 1336 AD through 1576 AD. Let me mention here that the independent sultans were outsiders. They had their own compulsions to keep their kingdom independent. 
They need to keep Bengals independent and also stop the transfer of financial resources outside of Bengal to Delhi. Monarchy being the leading mode of administration, the people, however, were not free. But they did enjoy the status of being inhabitants and diligence also of an independent kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, the spells of independence from the ancient through the medieval time did show that the people didn't have anything to do with whatever happened at the upper rung of administration. The first time an independent entity of Bangladesh evolved in 1971, wherein people had a voice with people's participation. And the architect of this Bangladesh was Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. And throughout the struggle for this independence, Bangabandhu was the prime leader calling the shots. Now, ladies and gentlemen, my paper has this subsection, Bangabandhu and the making of Bangladesh, of which a lot has already been spoken about by distinguished chairman and distinguished director general, but let me add a word or two by saying that Bangabandhu and Bangladesh are historically and epistemologically synonymous. Bangabandhu was personally the seer, but also the creator, of course, with people's input of the Bangladesh project. The independence of Bangladesh in its origin a revolution was egged on by his personal, political, philosophical cogitation. In 1974, Bangabandhu was reported to have confided in the eminent literature on Nuda Shankar Rai that he had conceived the idea of an independent Bangladesh as far back as 1947. And there are ample historical evidences to substantiate such a claim. I don't have time to recount all this evidence. In 1960, he joined hands with some progressive youths to float the Shadin Bangla Biplabi Porishad, a secret and apparently social cultural body its very name suggested a political agenda spread throughout the province. Some carefully selected youths were imbued with the idea of independence. A notice to be added here that while engaging himself in such paltry adventurous deeds, Bangabandhu had been serving as the our belief. General Secretary between 1953 and 1966, when he became president of the organization. It is understandable that the Arab League, although a Bagali oriented party, Bangabandhu appeared to have a deficit in his satisfaction of the party agenda in so far as Bagali emancipation was concerned and hence is explained his personal adventurous deeds. He would continue in this line of action until independence was achieved. In 1961, Bangabandhu was a catalyzer for two such secret deeds to craft a consensus vis-a-vis -vis the question of independence. He sought to reach across to the left political parties. Facilitated by the Fazal Hussein Malik Mia, there was a secret meeting with the comrades Kokarai and Moni Singh, wherein Bangabandhu 
sought their assistance in their bid for independence. While seeing eye to eye with the proposition, both the comrades advised caution for being secretive, as any public disclosure would bring in anti Bengali dictator Ayub's wrath. Both sides, however, agreed to consult the movements to reach the ultimate goal of independence. The second bid was to launch his entirely personal Purbo Bongo Mukti Front. A leaflet drafted in English by himself was printed at his own cost. The leaflet was delivered mostly by himself to foreign missions located in Dhaka, riding his own bicycle. The object was to sensitize the foreign missions about grievances and goal of the Bengali people. As there is contradictory evidence about the year of the secretary to Agartala, we prefer to be non-controversial by citing the years 1962 and 63. Bangabandhu's mission to Agartala was aimed to seek Indian assistance for his going over to London, where from he would start a movement for Bengali emancipation. Understandably, he took his cue from the struggle of Shubhav Chandra Bosch. Unfortunately, Jawaharlal Nehru, the Indian Prime Minister, immediately after the humiliating experience of the Indian-China war was not ready to engage himself in such an adventure. Despite the fact he did agree with the goal of the mission, it was assured that Bangladesh led by Bangabandhu would certainly get future assistance and help. So Bangabandhu had to return empty-handed. Nevertheless, ladies and gentlemen, this was the street was indicative of Bangabandhu's intensity of purpose for the achievement of which he even hazarded his personal security and safety. The next way station towards independence was the six point program and the rousing movement issued therefrom. Dubbed the Charter of Emancipation, the program initially sketched out a plan for political emancipation and the socio economic emancipation would wait until independence was achieved. In hearing in the program was political, economic, and military autonomy of the then East Pakistan, as had been adumbrated in the Lahore Resolution of 23rd March 1940. Bangabandhu bared his mind to the NAP from Moscow. Supremo Professor Muzaffar Ahmed that his only one point was independence put across equivocally, as reported to this writer by Professor Ahmed. The Ayub regime retorted to the six point demand by foisting upon Bangabandhu and 34 other pro Bengali civil and military officials the Agartala conspiracy case. Let me remind here that Bangabandhu used to call this conspiracy case Islamabad conspiracy case, and I think we should call it so. The youth movement called the 1969 mass uprising was mounted to confront the trial of Bangabandhu and others under this case. The slogans raised by the youth as the uprising gathered stridency showed the extent and depth of public support for the demand of independence. Under the sheer weight of popular movement, the Ayub regime retracted. The case was withdrawn on 22nd February. Bangabandhu, along with other accused, were released. This episode demonstrated the strength of people power against even a military dictatorial regime. This was also important of the things to come vis-a-vis -vis the run-off towards independence. 
Moreover, this was a litmus test of leadership for Bangabandhu, which he got through successfully, as on the following day after his release, a public reception at the DN Rescows bestowed upon him the epithet of Bangabandhu. Indeed, the six point movement and the conspiracy case skyrocketed Bangabandhu's popularity and catapulted him to the position of the sole Banas spokesman. On 5th of December 1969, at the memorial meeting on the bar, on the sixth death anniversary of Sarubardi Bangabandhu named East Pakistan, Bangladesh. This declaration was certainly inches forward to the cause of independent Bangladesh. The 1970 general elections were about to be boycotted as many senior army league leaders were averse to participating in meaningless elections because of the restrictions that had been imposed by Yahya Khan's legal framework order. This document sought to tie the hands of Bangabandhu in a way that he would not be able to recast the constitution as by the six points. But Bangabandhu let it be known that his party would surely take part in the elections and filmed, I quote him, my goal is the independence of Bangladesh. Once the elections are over, I shall tear the LFO into shreds. Who can then challenge me? The statement originated out of his immense self-confidence that he had and his party that he had to the effect that his he and his party would win the elections. History thereafter substantiated this self-confidence and rare far-sightedness of Bangabandhu. In the National Assembly, the Army League backed 167 out of 169 seats. In the Provincial Assembly, 288 out of 300 seats that the party garnered a landslide victory and the architect of which was Karish Patrick Bangabandhu himself. But the winning party was denied the expected political space through the machinations of the tram virate comprising Yahya, the military and over ambitious Bhutto. Even the National Assembly scheduled to begin its session in Dhaka on 3rd March was postponed without giving a new date. The Bagali people, led by Bangabandhu, reacted by mounting the unprecedented non-cooperation movement, thus creating the two monstrous march days from 1st through 25th of March, which in fact were the distant thunder for the Pakistani military junta. Ladies and gentlemen, the two monstrous March days were marked by a number of milestone events as Bangladesh neared independence. First and second March, Shadin Bangla Chhatra Shangram Parishad hoisted the green, red, golden flag of the would be independent country atop the arts faculty building on the University of Dhaka. Second and third March, the same group of youths at the Paltron rally proclaimed the manifesto of independence, wherein Bangabandhu was declared the supreme leader of the country. In other words, he was declared father of the nation. Third, Bangabandhu's decisive speech, I call it decisive speech, like there are many decisive battles and wars in the history of the world, speech Bangabandhu gave an equivocal call for independence to be achieved through a people's war fought with guerrilla tactics. Fourth, there were Mujib Yahya parties joined later by Bhutto between 16th and 24th March. Bangabandhu's intent on joining the police 
was to get across the message that he was a democratic leader and wanted a democratic solution to the political impasse. Yahya plus Bhutto had a different bent of mind. They were dilly dallying to buy time to complete military preparations for the eventual military assault on the people. The philosophical basis for the military solution to political crisis had been decided as far back as February 1971, when Yahya, in a meeting of generals in Dalpindi, was reported to have rowed quote, kill three million of them, that is the Bagalis. The rest will eat out of our hands, unquote. It appeared that by 25th March, military preparations had been complete for launching the Operation Searchlight. Thus, having given green signal for the Operation Ehea, eased himself out of Dhaka in the evening of 25th March. Bhutto did the same thing in the following morning, with the self-congratulatory words, quote, thank God Pakistan has been saved, unquote. He would soon realize that, that in fact, fact, this was the beginning of the death throes of Pakistan. Ladies and gentlemen, in his interview with David Frost on 18 January 1972, Bongo Bandhu divulged that he would have liked the Pakistan side to attack first and then the people would be in war in self-defense. This was exactly how things happened following the launching of the Operation Searchlight by about 11 p.m. Moreover, he had now ample reasons for making a formal declaration of independence. As it was by 12.20 a.m., Bangamundu recorded his declaration, which began with the word scout, this may be my last message. From today, Bangladesh is independent, unquote. By 1.30 a.m., he was arrested and later transported to Pakistan, where he had to pass 290 days of solitary imprisonment. Death was staring at him. Ladies and gentlemen, as Bangabandhu was incarcerated, Bangladesh confronted the Pakistan occupation forces. As per the directives contained in the 7th March speech, the people, Inside. especially the freedom fighters, waged a people's guerrilla war. The resultant liberation war was of eight months and 21 days. Ladies and gentlemen, not nine months, which we usually call. Eight months and 21 days was the shortest of such wars in, the, in history, although physically away in Pakistani captivity, Bangabandhu remained the guiding spirit and beckon light as his people trudged along the awful path of war. This kind of non-physical and entirely spiritual leadership is perhaps a rarity in the annals of leadership. The war was fought to success. In this asymmetric war, Bangladesh was the weaker side. But despite that, the occupation forces capitulated and surrendered humiliatingly on December 1971. Once again, the enormous might of people power prevailed over the marauding military juggernaut. Indeed, Bangladesh is the gift of a nexus between the leadership and between leadership and people power. Ladies and gentlemen, now I switch to my subsection titled Bangabandhu and People's Emancipation in Bangladesh. It was sheer providence plus international pressure to save his life, the, the leader of which was in the Indian Arabia in the country that Bangabandhu could come back alive, if not well, to Bangladesh in the afternoon of 10th January 1972. On the homecoming of Bangabandhu, the Guardian was often coming up. As to that, Shaykh Mujibi walks out of the Bhagavad Gita, 
जेल टू पावर अंक एंड देर वॉज ए फुल पेज बस्ट साइज पिक्चर of bangabandhu on the cover page it is worth noting that bangabandhu was equated with bangladesh and rightly so once once in bangladesh bangabandhu had to start almost from zero to build bangladesh a country a bangladesh which had emerged with dr henry kissinger's prognostication that the same would be a bottomless basket in a 1976 publication just farland and jer parkinson titled bangladesh the test case for development also forecast a bleak future of bangladesh but to the surprise of international development pandits bangladesh economy during the lifetime of bangabandhu grew at the average rate of 7% in his homecoming at his bangabandhu gave out ample indications as to how he would go about the obvious task of rebuilding the country one such major indication was that quote bangladesh will be an ideal state and the basis of which will not be any religion the basis of the state will be democracy socialism and secularism it may be mentioned that nationalism was added at the time of writing the constitution as the fourth fundamental principle of the state the people were exhorted to wage a struggle for emancipation on 14th march 1972 in their speech bangabandhu raised the slogan Quote, this time the struggle is for building the country and good bangabandhu's vision for an exploitation free sonar bangla was succinctly put forward in his draft shahi address of 9 may 1972 where he said quite poetically what do i want i want the people of bangla to get two square meals a day what do i want i want the jobless to get job what do i want i want the people of my bengal become happy what do i want i want that my people move move about in a jolly mood what do i want i want the people of bangla smile again to their hearts content uncle bangabandhu had in total 1314 days to serve the country which were divided into two phases pre bakshal that is 10 january through 24 january 1975 and post bakshal 233 days during the first phase the trend was to reconstruct bangladesh with whatever was available administrative and otherwise there was in fact no time to improvise everything new the imperative was first to bring back the totally devastated country to at least a running position consequently mostly the pakistani personnel and machine hurtled along the new bang in the new bangladesh the experience which bangabandhu gathered during this phase had been a mixed one indeed the turn around by the bakshal was an inevitable consequence of what had happened during the past phase bangabandhu himself characterized the new system as the democracy of the oppressed in a socialist matrix the bakshal had all the potentialities to effect a revolutionary turn around for bangladesh bangabandhu himself dubbed bakshal the second revolution meaning 1971 to be the first but it is ladies and gentlemen humbly suggested that as per definition and implied meaning of the construct of revolution 1971 defies revolution 
and the Bakshal was the first ever and only revolutionary move in Bangladesh, which, however, remained unfinished like its author's unfinished life. Bangabandhu was killed when his age was 55 years, four months, 29 days. Ladies and gentlemen, now I conclude. Bangabandhu was a political leader per se, but certainly not a literature of any sort, although he had a good knowledge of world literature. He did write a poem conceiving the state of the country while handing the poem to his confidant Abdul Gappa Chaudhary sometime in 1973, Bangabandhu ridiculed himself by saying, if it is not a Kobita, it is at least a Gobita. It is the Kobita na hoi, anta to Gobita to hoi chhe. Abang tar Bangla Kobita ti chilo, ephabe lekha, amar Kobita nirabe nipprite kaande, Bangla ru bhadra lokera shuri kare. That is Dushen Kaunsinar. Manush thakai fele phade, Akilal ghoda dhoda te chai. Buke pai betha. Jurainer Bashinda Polash. Prothwande ngwa kranto hai tar moro me. Pai kinar maath hai akranto chute piyo. Tabe nana hashpatal gure lo. Toh eishilo tar bangla kobita ame ingre juno baat kore. Maathi dhar pori. My poem wells in silence and isolation. The gentlemen of Bengal steal and cheat people by ensnaring them in trap. I would like to rush red hooks after them, but I feel pain in the chest. Have we earned independence for the country to be looked like this? Thank you very much indeed. 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 Then I'm Thank you, sir, for your very insightful analysis. As well as the wealth of information that you have provided for the life of the city corporation. There is a message that is the state of the city corporation. The name of the city corporation is the name of the city corporation. The name of the city corporation is the name of the city corporation. The name of the city corporation is the name of the city corporation. The name of the city corporation is the name of the city corporation. The name of the city corporation is the name of the city corporation. The name of the city corporation इंडिपेंडेंट टेलीविजन है आवाज बंद करें इंडिपेंडेंट टेलीविजन है आवाज बंद करें ओवर टू यू डॉक्टर अतिर रहमान ओके थैंक यू चेयर चेयर ऑफ द सेशन एम्बेसडर फजलुल करीम माय वेरी क्लोज एसोसिएट टुडेस चीफ गेस्ट हिज एक्सेलेंसी द फॉरेन मिनिस्टर ऑफ uh, Bangladesh. Uh, uh, everybody knows him, so I'm not uh, naming him. Also, the special guest, another very close uh, 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 PR of ours, uh, Dr. Shamsul Alam, uh, the Director General, uh, Major General Emdad Bari, uh, uh, His Excellencies, other guests, and particularly uh, my senior professor, uh, uh, said Anwar Hussain, who just delivered his valuable speech, and the participants. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, uh, August gathering. At the very uh, uh, beginning, let me pay my deepest homage uh, to the namesake of Bangladesh, uh, Bundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the father of the nation, uh, uh, who was assassinated in this month on the 15th. So my deepest respect to the memory of Bangabundu and all the martyrs of that uh, in a uh, fateful night. Also my respect to the four national leaders and all the martyrs of uh, uh, the freedom movement, war of liberation, uh, those are known and unknown. And of course, uh, uh, those who were killed on the 21st of August, 2004. Uh, I want to congratulate uh, uh, the BIISS 
for really not only organizing this uh, 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 webinar, but also for doing a great job by uh, uh, collecting the good materials for the book, which will be launched uh, 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 later. We have uh, just heard from Professor Hussein and also the chair uh, and a, a very good uh, uh, perspective has, historical perspective has already been set here. So I will not be going into the history so much. I will be instead talking about his uh, exceptional leadership and also his quest for inclusive development and, and Bangladesh. Uh, indeed, he is the namesake of, of Bangladesh and uh, uh, the state formation uh, uh, which he led in Bangladesh is exceptional as Professor Hussein has already uh, mentioned about it. Uh, it uh, uh, the Pakistan which was created was not his ideal. It was a false dawn for him. He did not want this Pakistan. Uh, uh, but anyway, reality he had to accept, but then he started uh, his uh, 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 movement for uh, uh, the project or the concept of Bangladesh right from the day one he landed to this part of, of Pakistan and uh, uh, defying all the challenges of uh, the Cold War, the illiberal and uh, uh, you know, uh, impractical, cruel state called Pakistan, uh, Bangabandhu really continued his journey and emerged as the most successful uh, leader uh, 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 in this part of the world, who was aesthetic, who was transformational, who was pragmatic, and also compassionate. His uh, all his moves, including his development moves, were always pragmatic. And I'm sure the two ministers will bear with me. You know, only three and a half years he ruled, uh, you know, he was uh, in charge of the country. And around that time, he really uh, uh, promulgated uh, and uh, got uh, uh, as many as 130 plus laws in place. He transformed a provincial government into a central government. He created all the institutions, including the central bank in such a short period of time and led the country to a very prosperous journey, which was not allowed to continue. He was pro-poor, pro-growth, pro-gender, pro-environment, pro-peace, and of course, uh, a, a global uh, 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 in his outlook. Uh, no doubt, you know, uh, uh, James Manor, Professor James Manor uh, uh, gave a, a talk uh, uh, called Understanding Bongo Bundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman at Suas, where I studied also uh, at the University of London on 10th of April, uh, 2018. And there he said, Bongo Bandhu stood out among many other leaders who were also fathers of their nations for at least three reasons. Number one, his secular views. A true secular leader, not an ethnic nationalist he was. He dropped the word Muslim from the name of his party to make it much modern and a secular party which really led the war of liberation. Again, he was an organizational man. He always believed in organization. He emphasized building organization at the grassroots, left the position of a minister to serve as the party general secretary and he, that he really, he really cared for his uh, followers and they too really uh, respected him. He was a compassionate leader and always understood them very well. He was also very flexible, as uh, Professor Hussein has indicated. He always he was always open for dialogues and negotiation, even in the worst of the circumstances. He was not at all a hot-headed agitator, as some people would like to put him. And uh, remember, after seventh March, there was hardly any scope for negotiation with Pakistan, but he was very very open 
to uh, uh, President Yahya Khan and good to around that time, knowing fully that they were the culprits. But even then, he uh, really respect with the respect. You know, he really negotiated with them to give the world a chance to understand that he was uh, at the receiving end, not at at the at the front. So that kind of uh, 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 leadership really helped him become the most legitimate spokesman for the Bengali because he was riding on the popularity of the Bengalis who voted him in a, in a overwhelming out of 169 seats, he, he got 167. So he was the natural leader, a natural elected leader. But then, even then with that leader, he told that even one of the members of the, of the, of the constituent assembly or the national assembly really differed. He would take care of the differing views. You know, that was the Democrat, uh, you know, a born Democrat as he was. He was, his movement for uh, 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 Bangladesh really started from at the early stage and he always really cared for the, uh, uh, you know, you know, people, you know, his, his, the, the ordinary people was at the, at the center of his struggle for independence. Bangabandhu's politics was focused on realizing the rights of the marginalized. If you remember, when he came back from Calcutta and uh, he started uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know language movement. You know he he said that this was not a movement for language only. It was it was later he said on uh, on the twenty first of February in nineteen fifty three in Armani Tola that this was our life and death question. You know, Jibon Moronel Lorai, and then he said this was the this was the struggle for our uh, accommodation for our education and for our uh, 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 rights, you know? So he, it was, it was uh, 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 and there was a socioeconomic perspective of that movement. Again, when authorities didn't respond to his normal demands, but he used to make demands, as you remember, even at the early stage, he worked, uh, he really led the dawals, the, 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 the farmers, you know, the casual farmers who used to uh, work for many of the uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 rich farmers could not collect the wages in, uh, in paddies. And he really went out for them to really make this Dawal movement. But he would then ask for it and, and would always try to negotiate. He led political movements to realize the rights. Only when the political movements were foiled by the conspirators, he started leading the struggle for independence with arms. So you must see that in Bonn, you know, he, he, was, he was a Democrat, but he was just. His idea, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the supreme uh, goal of his war of liberation or his entire lifetime movement was to achieve a society with without exploitation at the, at the he, this was the core of the uh, uh, development philosophy of bongo bondu and that's why i said it's, it's the quest for in the, uh, you know inclusive development was his biggest goal uh, on 15 december 1973 he said this independence will be meaningful to me only when the woes of the farmers liberals and the deprived of Bangladesh end. And I think this it goes very well with uh, Professor Hussein's, you know, Rashi uh, uh, Madrasa speech on that, what I want. I want that everyone should have a food. What I want, I want that everybody should really smile. You know, you know those kind of uh, 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 ideas were inbuilt into his thinking of, of uh, independence. If you, if you remember, he started uh, 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 rebuilding Bangladesh simply standing on the ashes. You know, he was standing on the ashes of the world. He had to reconstruct the world on infrastructures without any any resources in hand. You know, uh, uh, he had to rehabilitate 10 million refugees who were not having food. So he had to organize food for them, reconstruct about 2 million houses who were internally displaced. He had to you know, rehaul the regulatory institutions, including the central bank, as I told you. And uh, you know, standing on that odds, he was 
nearly on the very first meeting with the Professor Nurul Islam, you know, our teacher, uh, he started uh, uh, this uh, 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 planning commission for Bangladesh and the five-year plan. And he asked them to uh, go for the five-year plan because he wanted to have a planned approach to development. And uh, uh, at the same time, he was coping with the natural calamities and adverse geopolitical climate. I'm sure all of you are doing strategic research. You know, uh, the, the nasty uh, diplomacy of Pakistan around that time was you know, uh, poisoning the minds of most of the global leaders. And unfortunately, some of them really succumbed to their uh, you know, you know, nego uh, uh, the, the bad, bad negotiation and uh, diplomacy. And uh, uh, many of the countries were doing bad politics called food aid politics around that time. And uh, Bangladesh had to suffer for that. Literally, he had to start the journey from zero. You know, the, the economy size of the economy was only $8 billion, which is now 350 plus billion. There was not even a single dollar in the foreign exchange reserve around that time. The savings to GDP ratio around that time was only 3%. And the investment to GDP ratio was only 9%. And you know, the investment GDP ratio is now 32 plus, savings 31 plus, and the reserve is about $48 billion. What a journey, what a, what a transformation. You know, this could only be possible because of the strong base he set for us. And also for the last 12 years or so, his daughter is, is playing a very, very, in a, in a far-sighted and, and decisive uh, uh, leadership role. So all that made it possible. His uh, foundation for a very uh, a strong Bangladesh was his constitution. Not many constitution in the world would have so many developmental you know, you know, issues uh, imprinted in, in, the, in, in the constitution in, in itself. He had four you know, citizen-based uh, uh, agenda or the pillars of the constitution. Number one, nationalism, where uh, the, the, he identified uh, 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 that uh, the identity of, of the nation, the Bengali identity, and the self-respect as Beng Bengalis. Uh, the second was socialism, which he said, I'll not borrow it from anybody. This was an equitable society with local realities in mind, you know, this is uh, with a democracy in mind. And also he had democracy, which was parliamentary system to ensure people's part, uh, participation. And finally, I think this is the most decisive one is the secularism, you know, combating uh, 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 communal forces and maintaining social peace. The other day in a professor, uh, Amurtho Sen, the Nobel laureate was speaking on him in uh, London School of Economics and he said, Bongo Bondu is the Bisho Bondu because the world, world, world trend of world, mainly because of his uh, interpretation of secularism. His interpretation of secularism was that, you know, religion, you know, you have all the freedom of religions, no problem, but you cannot use the religion for politics. So that was his interpretation. And I, he said that this, this interpretation of secularism is so needed even in the to, today's world. So many countries, uh, are really falling victims to the 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 uh, the, uh, the fundamentalism and other religious based uh, uh, you know you know problems that we are witnessing in the geopolitics of the region. Bangabandhu's constitution ensured opportunities for all. You know, uh, he's uh, uh, he, not only he emphasized on democracy and human rights and decentralization. He was for free and mandatory education. One of, the, one of the three most important policies of Bongo Bondu at the very early was that, you know, he nationalized primary education. Uh, about, he gave employment to about 100,000, you know, uh, uh, of the uh, primary teachers. Uh, and again, 30,000 primary uh, uh, schools were nationalized. You know, this was a big move. Secondly, he went for, you know, social consciousness raising for family planning. You know, that was another great move. Thirdly, he went for, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, around that policy of uh, de uh, decentralizations and, and uh, uh, democratic uh, uh, movement on, from, the, from the ground. And 
he was always in favor of uh, people's rights. So he went for rural development, agricultural revolution. In fact, the third one, I'm sorry, was, was, the, was the food, you know, food autarky. He said, it's very humiliating for a leader like me to really beg for food. And when there is a food aid politics, so you have to become sur sur surplus in, in food. And he uh, gave so much of emphasis on agriculture and rural development. Uh, uh, emancipation of the workers was also in written in the constitution. Cooperation for studying private sector was there, right to employment and basic needs approach, and a special focus on women's you know, in a, in emancipation was also written in the constitution. So uh, in for later, we also added in the constitution, the, the preservation of the nature. So these are fantastic uh, constitution that we, we now have. He was always in favor of education. He prioritized education for emancipation of the masses and advocated investing 4% of the GDP for education. In 1970, when he gave this pre-election speech, he said that we need at least 4% of the GDP in education, which even today we could not go that far. So he was so far-sighted. He uh, 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 you know, you know, created this Kudrote Kuda Commission to train a workforce that will be optimistic about the country. And, and the, 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 of the, of the uh, uh, Kudrote Kuda election commissions, you know, the, the ideas were to develop a workforce that, a, that was humane, secular, committed and is morally strong. And he wanted also uh, to develop leadership, character, respect for physical labor and Bangla to be the medium of instruction. Another idea was science and technology education should get the priority, prioritizing education for girls and women. And finally, the goal of higher education to create graduates who will work for an equitable society. These were the ideas of education, the inclusive development I'm talking about. And education is the road to civilization, as you all know. So he was really mending the small roads you know, to go to that higher ends of civilization. He worked on two legs for balanced development. You know, agriculture was one leg, industry was his other leg. Agriculture to provide food for huge population, the largest portion of the workforce of the newly independent country to be employed in agriculture. Agriculture will supply raw material for industries and demand for goods. And that's why he said that there is no alternative to increased agricultural production in the context of the politics of age the nasty politics of aid. I'm sure the foreign minister would clearly understand that because he has been negotiating. So uh, on the strategy for industrialization, you know, he was, uh, of course, uh, initially for state-led, uh, you know, uh, uh, development, but, but he was not closed, you know, his ideas were not closed. He had uh, windows for private sector and also for the cooperatives. The state took the initial responsibility of industrialization because all the entrepreneurs were Pakistanis and they left suddenly. So there was no option but to take, again, the commitment for his style of socialism was also inbuilt into this state-led industrialization that we saw. And the first five-year plan emphasized on creating an uh, enabling environment for the private sector as well. And in 1974, 75, he raised the ceiling of really yeah, private investment from 2.5 million taka to 30 million taka just uh, overnight. And, and 133 abandoned units were handed over to private sector. So he was not against private sector. He was just waiting and balancing. Even today, you know, we have a strong uh, 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 state sector, but again, private sector is playing its interesting role. So he was indeed the leader was the was the driving force. Uh, Professor Nurul Islam, the deputy chairman of the planning commission during Bangabandhu's period, said, "We assume that to widespread mass popularity of apex of the ruling party, especially the prime minister, leading to a strong control over the structure of the party and." Owing to his imposing personality, it will be 
possible to keep the power factions in and out of the party in a balanced state. So he really thought he was the biggest capital for leading the Bangladesh to an inclusive development. He was also a global leader with far-sighted foreign policy. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been doing research and this book must have included chapters on that. I just quote from his speech on the, at the UN even that will say that I know how 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 uh, in a in a uh, 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 global he was he was local he was global he looked inside he looked outside so he, he was a, he was a very balanced leader he said we can look forward to a world where human creativity and the great achievements of our age in science and technology will be able to shape a better future free from the threat of nuclear war and based on sharing of technology and resources on a global scale so that men everywhere can begin to enjoy the minimal conditions of a decent life. Even in his foreign policy, he's bringing the people's in a, in a decent life in, into his foreign policy. So he was so much a humane leader, a compassionate leader. And again, with uh, uh, him, you know, he started with minus 12% growth. And that country really moved forward under his leadership, you know, and despite resource constraint, you know, he was committed to building institution, infrastructures, human capital for attaining inclusive development. And you see this in this diagram, you know, uh, that, you know, he started with a per capita income of only $93. By 1975, he reached $273 and minus, uh, uh, you know, in his absence, Bangabundu's absence, next year, uh, it was $138 per capita income dropped from 273 to 138. And the next year, 77, it was only $128. Uh, uh, and uh, within less than four years, per capita income almost in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a triple, as we have seen, but the nation got derailed when the Bangladesh uh, or uh, Bongobundu was killed uh, uh, on 15th August. After, you know, uh, it took 13 more years to really reach 1975 years or uh, 75 uh, per capita income. It took us up to 1988 to go up to $270 uh, as a per capita income. So you can understand the, you know, you know, the magic of the leadership who really took the country forward in three years. And then we ended up in a, in a dark age. I don't want to go into that. I'll, I'm almost done. You know, uh, 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 I, I could speak for hours, but now I want to really concentrate on his leadership quality and, and conclude. Uh, the traits that made him a great leader, you know, he, he could generate emotions. He used to encourage the people to struggle for decades. Secondly, he also had the, uh, you know, in a, in a magnanimity of developing co-leaders, you know, uh, he mentored those who eventually oversaw the war of liberation. They never let us felt that he was not physically with us. His ideas, you know, these co-leaders were so uh, 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 in a in a meaningfully uh, in a steer the war of liberation along with him as as the top uh, he, he believed in maximization of engagement he could reach people from all walks of line in liberating and reconstructing the country and he had long term vision he was not always short term he had long term vision like his daughter who is now thinking about 100 years of Delta plan. So he was, he always dreamt of a prosperous Bangladesh, Sunar Bangla, and emphasized on long term planning for people centering transformation of Bangladesh. A truly a transformation leader heads off to him. I will just now uh, recite a poem from. Uh, Shamsu Rahman to pay my homage to this greatest of the great leaders, uh, not only of Bangladesh, but also of the, uh, of the world. Hail that man on whose name the sun shines down eternally, like a song comes down the rains of Shravan, whose name never collects dust. Hail that man over whose name the moonlight crane spreads his wings. Hail that man on whose name liberation flutters like a flag. Hail that man whose name echoes 
in the victory cries of freedom fighters. Dhanno shei purush jar namer upor rodro jhore chirokal gan hoye neme ashe shraboner bishti dhara jar namer upor kokhono dhulo jomte dey na hawa. Dhanno shei purush jar namer upor pakha mile dey josnar sharosh. Dhanno shei purush jar namer upor potakar moto dulte thake shadhinota. Dhanno shei purush jar namer upor jhore mukti juddha der joyantoni. Let's pay homage to that great man, the father of the nation, Bongo Bundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. And as well as, let us celebrate our independence on his birth century and also the golden jubilee of Bangladesh, the freedom he gifted us. Let's celebrate it. Thank you so much. Joy Bangla. Joy Bongo. Thank you indeed, uh, Dr. Atiyah Rahman, for your very informative and detailed presentation, especially highlighting the contours of Bangabandhu's socio-economic uh, development policies. Uh, and we will uh, now enter into the discussion uh, element of uh, our uh, webinar today. There is a small, slight change in our program. So the floor is now uh, open for uh, comments and questions. Please uh, do identify yourself and uh, try to be as brief as possible because of the paucity of time. Thank you very much. The floor is open. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I uh, come in now? Uh, I am. Shamshir no Mubin Chaudhary, former Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh. Uh, and I'm very, uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm very happy to uh, be, have been invited to this uh, webinar today, a very timely one, and I thank uh, BISS for organizing this. I'll be very brief. Uh, one of the title of the webinar today, the word emancipation appears very clearly. So this was one of the principles of our father of our nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the emancipation of people. It's not just emancipation of people of Bangladesh, but emancipation of all suppressed people. And this is, it is his belief in this, uh, strong belief in this principle that led Bangladesh to recognize the provisional revolutionary government of Vietnam. And I'm so happy to see the ambassador of Vietnam here. And I have myself served as ambassador to Vietnam for four years, as early as 1973, uh, when uh, even before Saigon had been liberated by uh, the forces of North Vietnam. Sorry, it was in January 1975 that Wang sent a message that we rec recognize the provisional government of Vietnam in Hanoi, which actually represents or the sole and legitimate representative of the people of Vietnam. So this was a very uh, defining uh, uh, demonstration of Bongo Bundu's uh, principle of supporting uh, any suppressed people. And when I was ambassador to Vietnam, I had a great pleasure in, keeping, in, in reminding the Vietnamese leadership and especially General Zia, the great fighter who was still alive, uh, that we were among the first non-Warsaw Pact member and this is, I highlight to non warsaw Pact member that recognized the provisional revolution government of Vietnam. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Shamsul Mohamed Chaudhary. And the next. Uh, well, uh, I'm I, I, please, uh, Air uh, Can I have something to say? Air Commodore Ishfaq. You have the floor, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, whatever has been covered today by two eminent speakers, of course, I haven't had the look at the book. Uh, I'm sure uh, it, it will be extremely illuminating and informative. But one thing I want to say as an ex uh, uh, Air Force person, that uh, Bangabandhu's uh, role in uh, building up the military force in Bangladesh, uh, you know, right from the day one, 
And uh, we, just like the way uh, Dr. Atu said, I mean, the banking or central administration, we had almost nothing. Similarly, the military, we, we had almost nothing. No infrastructure, no, uh, you know, uh, um, sort of organization, organizational structure was developed. So we got into this right from the beginning, from day one. And uh, in uh, army headquarters organized, the air force headquarters organized, the naval headquarters organized, the arms and equipments. I have written about it in, in a number of articles. And, you know, in Bhagavad in his first uh, visit to Moscow, uh, soon after that, he, uh, our area of Khandakar at that time, the chief of air staff, we visited and we got our, we had no aircraft. We got the latest MiG-21 aircraft and the transport aircraft, the helicopters, nearly 400 uh, plus uh, officers and men were, uh, went to uh, Soviet Union at that time to get the training. Similarly, we, the Navy had no uh, ship, what mentioning, so when Marshal Tito came here, soon after that we got our first, Navy, Navy got the first modern uh, patrol boat at that time. And some of them may be still uh, flying, I don't know. And similarly, the tanks came from, uh, we didn't have, so they came from uh, Egypt because in 1973 war, we sent two military mission, one to, uh, no, to Egypt we sent some tea. That was the thing we, we could do at that time and also a medical mission to Syria. So from Egypt, we got this tank. So I want to emphasize, and very soon we had the air structures structures, the army headquarters structures. We had no experience. We borrowed uh, documents from here and there and, uh, and uh, we, we got the things done. So that is something often uh, when we talk about economic development, this also should be highlighted. So I thought that uh, you know, in some forum, it will be discussed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Your points have been well taken. Yeah, indeed, uh, Bangamundu actually uh, had had the plan to develop Bangladesh in every sector. And Dr. Atir, uh, definitely, he had highlighted on the basically social and economic sectors, and uh, with with the aim that Bangamundu had to establish an exploitation-free society. So he also had his eyes on other sectors of the country, like as you have rightly pointed out, on, on establishing the army headquarters on the Air Force and Na Navy. Thank you very much. And anyone else who wants to take the floor? Please raise your hands. And Can introduce I? yourself. Uh, Mr. Salauddin, do you hear us? You have the floor. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Mr. Salauddin. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the network. Hello, this is Salauddin. Salauddin Ahmed. I'm former member of Bangladesh Energy Regulatory Commission. Is it okay, sir? Can I proceed with my question? Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm particularly referring to Dr. Atiur Rahman, Professor Atiur Rahman, sir. Uh, uh, he was mentioning probably 30,000 plus primary schools were nationalized those days. Very difficult time was that. And now time has changed. I want to mention a, a particularly point to the attitude of the government, that government, Bongo Buntu particularly, uh, the attitude toward education of the nation. Uh, how can we see the reflection of the same attitude? Of course, time has changed. The size of the economy has changed. Many things have changed. How can we see the same reflection of the same attitude of Bongo Buntu in the present day government decisions, particularly towards the primary education, its quality, and of course, the weight uh, thank you very much. My question, of course, is to Professor Atiyu Rahman. I reiterate, thank you for giving me the floor. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We'll definitely go to the panelists. But first, uh, let us take the next question or comment. Dr. Zahid Khan, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, loud and clear. Please go ahead. Right, sir. Uh, this is a rather much of a, a comment because I have a piece on the book and it's about the uh, enduring principles of uh, Bangladesh Sheikh Majibur Rahman uh, about the foreign policy and uh, extracted from the text of his uh, speech at the uh, uh, 
uh, United Nations General Assembly uh, in 1974. Uh, and much of it was talked about uh, by all the presenters today. So what I found in that uh, particular research is that Bangladesh remains uh, one of, is the only example of uh, forcibly creating a new state propelled by the uh, ethno-linguistic movement in the Cold War era. So our, our creation is much of uh, a global uh, sort of uh, phenomena, uh, which is exceptional. And this was probably possible uh, by the uh, leadership of Bangabundu. And uh, the voting data that I've analyzed on that is about, uh, taking about 1,200, uh, 1,284 resolutions. It reflects that uh, over the period, Bangladesh has remarkably remained consistent uh, around 92 to 100% yes votes on the ideals that Bangabundu has set forth. So this is one of the uh, unique uh, point that I wanted to emphasize through this uh, particular uh, engagement that uh, his enduring principles remains alive uh, even today uh, in, in the questions of non-alignment, peaceful coexistence, economic emancipation and global solidarity, which has become much more uh, relevant in this uh, COVID-19 era. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Jahid Khan. I don't see any more hands raised. So let us go. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, let, us, let, let us go to the to our presenter. Can you hear me? Pardon? Zarina Khan. Uh, Zarina Khan, okay, you have the floor. Yeah, Th thank you. Uh, uh, I would like to understand today speaking, and it would be a very short, brief uh, comments that I'm going to make. Um, uh, remembering Mongo Bundu and all our respect for him. Uh, of course, we remember Mongo Bundu every day, but when the dates for this tragic incidents come, we, we get overwhelmed and we think of it. But Bongo Bundu's philosophy and Bongo Bundu's life is an everyday uh, learning for us. It's not for a particular day. By stating this, I would like to say that I was listening to both the speakers very attentively. And uh, 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 it, it is so impressive. And there was not a single area, even the tiniest single area of uh, Bangladeshi life that Bongo Bundu had not thought of or had not addressed during his very short period of life. His incomplete life, his, um, uh, he was not allowed to complete whatever he was intended to do in this world, which was not only for Bangladeshis, for the entire global community. He definitely would have contributed so much more had he been allowed to live. So with due respect, but this is what happens in history. Probably he has become so close to us now because he was not allowed to continue with his life. Uh, from the two speakers detail uh, narration of the history uh, of, of the political progresses and uh, the economic developments, and also to some extent, the societal development that Bongo Bodhu had uh, in his life addressed and tried to do something about it is that he was a people's person. He came out of a community which was basically village-based and he was a people's person because of that. And the more I read about him, the more I hear about him, I realized that as soon as he started thinking uh, as a person, he started thinking of the people around him. And I think that is the greatest, greatest lesson that we should learn from him, that he was a people's person and he dreamt of Bangladesh, but he, his dreams were based to me on realities of his fellow Bangladeshis, whether it was social, economic, political, uh, what, uh, uh, you know, uh, physical well-being, whatever it was, it was all based on his concern or not himself or his family, but for the entire Bengali community. I think that is the biggest lesson we should learn, especially when through go, after every few years, go, we go through a political crisis in Bangladesh, which we, uh, you know, uh, which we discuss, 
we debate and we at times seem to be unable to reach to a conclusion of how to solve it. So I think if we remember this, if we straight look at how intensive his purpose was to uh, think only of the people of Bangladesh. <clears throat> and by the people of Bangladesh, basically he was thinking of all the people, the masses who are downtrodden, who were poverty stricken, uh, who had no access to education, who had no access to good health, everything was left to Allah to, to look after them. And that was what Bongo Bundi, I think Bongo Bundi thought and th said that, no, this can be uh, reversed. This can be, uh, the uh, history of Bangladesh can be rewritten and rewritten so that Bangladesh can come at the top of in the world community. I think he dreamt his dream was based on realities. It was not daydreaming. And that is why we got what we got even after he had left. So Bongo Bundu to me uh, is, a, is a person, a very real person, one of us who cared and thought for old and young. He was young at one time, but he was starting to get older, but he, he always included. I, as far as I remember, I had been as a young girl to go to the university, attended his uh, 7th of March uh, speech at the race course from the fringes, of course, we, we were not allowed to go in then. Um, and I can remember as many women in that meeting as men. So as a female citizen of this country, I, I did not feel any difference at that point in time or at any point in time whenever Bongo Bundu's issues came up or when he was addressing the people, when he was talking to the people. And the other thing which is very striking, and I'm sure all of you will agree with that, he never said uh, Bangalida, Amar Lok, Amar Manush. It was always, he owned Bangladeshi people. He owned all of us. And that is why he could undauntingly carry out what he did in a very incomplete, unfinished, uh, unfinished uh, 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 dreams that he had dreamt. But even then, if you follow, and we always go through a serious, uh, you know, uh, time of crisis every every few uh, years. And I think we should remember that that whatever we are doing. Like we, uh, there was talk about decentralization. There was talk about how he thought of the uh, the poorest of poor person in his village who was not getting health service. So we have to think always that whatever we are doing in whatever field of area we are, we what do, what can we do to address the uh, uh, the inconveniences, the hardships of the of the general masses, not us. Even in the situation of COVID, you see, ultimately we had to go to the village level. We had to go to the institutions that Bongo Bondu dreamt of and later on was made as policy, passed in the parliament, the administrative and the local government structure through which we had to go to actually get the most success in getting the people uh, vaccinated as quickly as possible. So it's the people, let us not ever forget that Bongo Bondu stood for the people. He, fro he rose up from the people, people, he was for the people and he would have everything for the people. It is not only us middle-class educated professional people, we were very lucky and we also enjoyed whatever Bongo Bondu had contrib contributed, the huge uh, institutionalization that he had done in every area of our, our statehood. Uh, we, we were the beneficiaries we, got, we were lucky to come where we came, but there are still many, many, many unlucky people uh, uh, in our country. And we want to believe in Bongo Bundu. We want to believe in his ideology so that every single person in Bangladesh can stand up and declare to the world that I am a Bangladeshi. I'm a proud Bangladeshi. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Jarina Rahman, for your very valid points.
Uh, we'll now turn to our uh, presenters. Uh, but sorry, I did not. Uh, can I? Can I just one minute? I did not introduce myself. I am please, please. former please. professor of the Department of Public Administration, Dhaka University. Thank you Thank very you. much, Professor Zarina Rahman, for your very valid points. Uh, we'll now turn to our presenters today uh, with uh, Dr. Sweda Norosen. Would you like to add something sir, to the comments and questions? No. Okay. Over to you then, Dr. Atiur Rahman. Uh, just, just, just by Dr. Hussain. I didn't get much of input from the honorable speakers to respond to. Nevertheless, I got a point from Professor Jorina Rahman Khan. She, while making her comment, she said, narration of history. I'm sorry, your use of the word is improper. What I did was interpretation of history. Narration and interpretation are not the same. Thank you. Thank you. Now over to you, Dr. Atiur Rahman. Uh, thank you, Chair. I really want to come in just to thank uh, a lot of uh, uh, the participants have put their comments in the chat box. Uh, I really want to particularly really recognize the comments by uh, uh, Mr. Ramesh Singh, uh, by Mahaboob Alam, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, His Excellency Shamshir Movin Chaudhary, and many others uh, 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 for really hearing my speech and giving their minds. Uh, uh, I also recognize the comments by Professor Jarin Rahman Khan. In fact, I couldn't, uh, uh, I didn't have enough time to mention uh, about the issues, uh, particularly on women uh, she mentioned about. Uh, I would particularly uh, request the participants to read his book, uh, you know, New China 1950, if you really want to know more about the women and also uh, about uh, uh, the marginalized how that you know back in 1952 when he was only 32 he was not a mid he was not a member of the parliament he was not a minister he was the joint secretary of the party and there he looked for you know you know you know how women were rehabilitated and reformed in 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 that country how the prostitution was you know in you know, a reformed and abandoned how how their the the beggary was was uh, 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 in a in a uh, uprooted how the women were uh, going to the even the uh, in a army and uh, well forty percent of them were participating in the in the formal labor force and then he uh, he he went to the you know workers uh, uh, colonies he went to the agri uh, farmers uh, uh, factory uh, farmers uh, farms. Uh, uh, so he he was looking he was as if he was preparing for this big role which he was anticipating and and this particular book I would say you know and it gives you a lot of uh, you know information about inclusive development that he was really trying to do through his constitution later plans and everything a lot of things he really learned from his own in a, in a life you know he, it was his li lifelong struggle for inclusive development and that is what uh, uh, jerina has really tried to uh, push and i really want to thank for that and as for uh, uh, the uh, salauddin's comment on primary education let me give the answer in the words of rabindranath tagore tagore said you know uh, uh, the education is really the way to reach the highway of civilization and the primary education is metropolitan you know rural rural path and bongo bondo understood that very well so he started with the primary education and his uh, you know other uh, educational initiatives really originated from the kudrate khuda commission and the plan documents can you imagine this pandemic we are going through all the digital education and all that he thought about it long back you know, back in around that time, he talked about, you know, distance education. He talked about education through radio, television, and he was uh, uh, talking about Bed Bunia. You know, so he, he had a you know, much more farsighted mind and uh, he was an inclusive leader indeed. And uh, uh, from that perspective, 
Bongo Bondu is Bangladesh. You know, that's what whatever his ideas, you know, got reflected into the constitution, the war of, uh, uh, you know, declaration of the independence, everything really emanated from the, uh, as, as Zeria was telling, for the emancipation of the ordinary people. You know, the people uh, used to love him and he said, I love them too much. And again, his emphasis on corruption should have been also discussed. I didn't have enough time. The last speech he gave on the 26th of uh, March in 1975 about the, you know, you know, he gave a definition of corruption. He said, my farmers are not corrupt. My, my laborers are not corrupt. You know, we 5% educated ones are corrupt. And again, uh, you know, uh, uh, Shajan Priti doing for their own relatives is also corruption. You know, uh, not doing the work which you are assigned is not also corruption. You know, it's a broader definition of corruption. And I thought I have written on this. So I thought, you know, these are far reaching ideas. We must really read him uh, uh, more thoroughly to understand them. I just want to uh, uh, conclude my intervention with a small quote from Tagore. Tini bole chilen, je deshe jonmalei desh apon hoy na. Desh ke jante hoy, desh ke bhalo vaste hoy. Ami ekটু ghuriye bolbo je Bangladesh jonmalei Bangladesh amar hoy na. Bangobondhu ke jante hobe, Bangobondhu ke bhalo vaste hobe. Ebong tini tinti boi rekhe gechen take janar jonne ar tar oshongkho ain niti to royeche. Sotorang ashun amra aro gobhir bhabe Bangobondhu ke jani ebong সেই ভাব তার মাধ্যমে বাংলাদেশকে চিনি এবং বাংলাদেশকে জানি এবং বাংলাদেশকে ভালোবাসি ধন্যবাদ সবাই थैंक यू वेरी मच डॉक्टर अतिउर रहमान फॉर योर एलिसिटेशंस नाउ लर्निंग ऑडियंस नाउ इट्स टाइम टू लिसन टू आवर स्पेशल गेस्ट ऑनरेबल स्टेट मिनिस्टर फॉर प्लानिंग एंड आई टेक दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू फेलिसिटेट यू on your uh, recent appointment to this present position. And given your close ties and association with this institute, it is a very good news for all of us. Thank you. And uh, the floor is yours. Honorable Mr. Minister of Planning, Dr. Uh, thank Shantla. you. Thank you. Today's chief guest, uh, His Excellency Honorable Foreign Minister, Dr. A.K. Abdul Momen. Honorable His Excellency, uh, DGBIISS, and distinguished paper presenters, dear participants. I should be very brief because number of participants uh, no, uh, is falling. Uh, a very good day to you all. In this month of mourning, I respectfully pay my homage to the departed soul of uh, Bangabundu, along with other martyrs of the 15th August. 1975, and also uh, uh, heartful uh, tributes to the martyrs, uh, martyrs of the carnage of 21 August 2004, and seek divine blessings for all of the departed souls of those fateful events in August. Today's title, uh, of course, uh, to the title of discussion, set by the BIISS is historically contextual with heart rendering touches. The presentation and discussions are rich, reflecting pertinent stylized facts of Bangabundu's life, contribution, and attainments. Our commemoration must inspire us to build our own life ideals with the spirit of Bangabundu's sacrifices and deeds. We must transpire the spirits of uh, Bongo Bondu's ideals and lifelong contributions for the cause of masses, including peasants, laborers, and citizenry in general. Bongo Bondu's ever insurmountable contribution is the creation of uh, an independent Bangladesh. Bengali nation uh, in, Bangla, uh, in Bengal Delta and consolidation of our independence in farm hands. I'd like to note here in brief, the milestone goals and targets he helped to attain 
with his magical leadership and charisma during his short period of administration after the emergence of Bangladesh. We may recapitulate that after his triumphant homecoming on 10 January 1972, within 20 days, Bangabandhu returned, he established Bangladesh Planning Commission on 31st January on that year, uh, meaning with four leading economists of that time, headed by Professor Nur Islam, and having three other renowned economists emphasizing rehabilitation and reviving the uh, economy in soon as possible time. We may note here, after independence with, uh, after independence with premiership of charismatic leader Jawaharlal Nehru, who established Indian Planning Commission in 1951, after almost four years of uh, their independence in Pakistan, they established their Planning Commission in 1953, after around six years of their independence. So this actually reflect how Bangabandhu was uh, desperate to build his own country uh, as soon as possible through, a, through following a planned path of growth. So he created the Planning Commission uh, at the very outset. On 16 December, Bangabandhu signed the first constitution that is one of the best democratic uh, in a democratic polity in the world held parliamentary election in 1973. The constitution uh, was framed less than a year. It's really, uh, one should you know, recognize this. Usually constitution making takes two, three years to come up with. Anyway, he, he, he uh, held election on the, on that, based on that constitution in 1973 collected arms and ammunition from all the freedom fighters, organized armed forces, police forces, established uh, bureaucracy, and set the administration in quick, uh, quickest possible time. So we did not have very experienced uh, you know, bureaucratic uh, people at that time. So at that time, you all know, uh, most of the deputy commissioners, uh, you know, uh, were given the assignment of secretaries after returning from, you know, uh, uh, returning from the, uh, after returning from uh, our uh, government in exile, or those who were in the country supporting our liberation of war. All these while at the time we are in depth of, uh, in depth of, uh, in that of appropriate and experienced manpower. Bongondu arranged Indian forces, you all know, our allied force in time of our liberation struggle, leave in March 1972, within less than three months of our independence. Uh, we may think of staying of American forces in Japan, one referred to in discussion. Yet since the Second World War, staying in South Korea since 1954, and in the Philippines since 1975. What courageous and far-reaching decision by a national hero. Bangabundu started running the administration with empty coffer. As the Pakistani occupied forces burned the paper monies of the then state bank branch in Motijil on the morning of 16 December 1971, before the surrender of the Pakistan forces, Pakistan forces, uh, they surrendered uh, in the afternoon of that day. Before they took all gold, gold reserves, reserves kept at that time in, in, in the then state bank here. The economy was shattered and um, and you all know, uh, and ruined almost all. Even then, Bangabandhu relieved the farmers from paying rents of their lands up to 25 bigas. We drew all certificate cases for non-payment of rents. 
Bangundu had to nationalize jute and textile mills and other mills factories left by Pakistani owners and had to look for appropriate management, uh, managerial manpower. At the very outset, even though there was debt of funds, Bangundu established Bangladesh Agriculture Research Council at Farmgate to coordinate and help initiate agricultural research. Established Bangladesh Jute Research Institute at Shari Bangla Nagar. Established Bangladesh Cotton Development Board, uh, Bangladesh Sugarcane Research Institute, and organized BADC, Bangladesh Agriculture Research Development uh, Corporation. For expansion of irrigation and agricultural input distribution, established Bangladesh Rice Research Institute and Bangladesh Agricultural Research Institute. Atomic Agricultural Research Institute, what we call BINA, at BU campus at Maimanshi, and Bangladesh Rural Development Board, so and so forth. Agricultural development and diversification we have today achieved uh, tremendous uh, progress under the leadership of uh, Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. The foundation of the institutional foundation, I should say, institutional foundation of this progress and development was set by uh, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman during his tenure. Of the first budget of Bangladesh, with allocation of 776 crore taka, the development budget was of 500 crore taka. Of that, 101 crore taka was allocated for agricultural sectors. For attaining food autarky and reducing hunger and poverty, Bangabandhu allocated the highest amount in development budget for agriculture, and this ignited green revolution in Bangladesh during the early years of the 70s. First five-year plan of Bangladesh was prepared in one year, uh, in one year and started uh, its implementation on 1 July 1970-74, fiscal year, emphasizing rehabilitation and job creation in the country. 107 countries recognized Bangladesh during uh, Bangabandhu's short period of administration. And Bangabandhu at that time uh, nationalized, I think, 24,000 primary schools and established fast Education Commission headed by Kudrati Khuda. We can have a long list of Bangabandhu's milestone attainments for transformation of uh, transformation and establishment of uh, uh, transformation of uh, our social and economic life. We can only uh, add value of all these you know, uh, commemorations and discussions on Bangabandhu and his life uh, contributions if we would be able to imbibe ourselves with his immortal ideas of humanity, democracy, and secularism. All may go in vain or get unstable if we deviate from any of his ideas. Our statehood and for uninterrupted development, we must have political institutions with Bangabandhu's ideals for establishing exploitation-free society. And uh, Bangabandhu reiterated so many times of a exploitation-free society. We must have to root out corruption from every sphere of our social and economic existence. Source of power should be politics and political institutions. Political institutions free of corruption and usurpations that will lead to eradicate corruption from every sphere of life for establishing a society of democratic values. We have to root out terrorism, also religious fundamentalism, and extremism to make our development sustainable and inclusive. 
we want all killers of Bongo Bundu of that fateful night and the uh, sequential perpetrators of 21 August uh, should be brought under justice in any time soon uh, to remove the blood stain from our history. Under the leadership of Honorable Sheikh Hasina, we charted the path of attaining Sunar Bangla by around 2041 as dreamt by Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. We will be a upper middle income country by 2031 and free from poverty and illiteracy, free of unemployment by 2041. We are on course of implementation of the eighth five-year plan, attaining 8.51% GDP growth by 2024-2005. During the seventh five-year plan period, the nation attained two milestone targets, becoming a lower middle income country and twice qualified the criteria of becoming a developing country, leaving the stigma of least developed country. And that will be formally accorded by, I mean, developing country uh, recognition by the General Assembly of the UN in 2026. That is the way actually, after fulfilling, you need to wait for another uh, three years. And this time because of COVID, it is extended to five years to be formally announced by General Assembly of the UN. What I want to say, we are on course of rapid economic and social uh, transformation. And for this, we have aptly emphasized human resource development the most in our new national development planning of the sixth five-year plan during seventh five-year plan, in, even in the eighth five-year plan, we emphasized uh, that we get the first priority uh, on human development. For this to materialize, education system must cater to the need of the hour, embracing technological advancement in course content, enriching moral and democratic and nationalism. Education institutions at every tier should be operational as soon uh, as it is possible. We have already lost one year and a half, a big generation loss, which we need to recover. Our respected teaching community should play a uh, dedicated and non-partisan role in this regard who are golden soldiers in our national building. I should stop here uh, because I initially I said I should be brief. I humbly thank BISS for inviting me in this important webinar, the luminary paper presenters, uh, two our, of our iconic uh, figures. I very thankfully, um, and I very thankfully, I'm very thankful to uh, BIIS for your you know, well-prepared, focused, and informative, uh, having informative presentations from two uh, of our iconic figures. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangabundhu, Bangladesh, Chiru Jubiho. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shamsul Alam, uh, Honorable State Minister for Planning, for your very useful remarks, especially highlighting uh, the achievements of Bangabandhu in a very short period of time after the liberation of Bangladesh. Dear participants, uh, the Institute has published a, a book, has just published a book on, on Bangabandhu, and uh, it uh, will be the responsibility of Dr. Mahfuz Haq, Director of BIS, to introduce the book to you. Dr. Mahfuz Kabir, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chairman, uh, Honorable Chief Guest of, of today's event, uh, Honorable Special Guest, uh, Chairman uh, and Director General of BISS, uh, distinguished speakers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, uh, we'd uh, go to, uh, in fact, launch the book titled Bongo Bondhu and Bangladesh, an epic of uh, a nation's emergence and emancipation. So uh, uh, basically, 
this book aims to celebrate the birth centenary of the greatest Bengali of all time, the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. And uh, as a part of this venture, this organized a number of uh, programs, the seminars and webinars throughout the year since March 2020. And the events aim to revisit Bangabandhu's thoughts, ideas, vision, and also reaffirm Bangladesh's commitment to addressing the contemporary world issues based on uh, his ideals. And this book is, uh, is a compilation of revised and edit edited versions of the papers presented and uh, deliberations made in these events. And it aims to present the ideas in a more comprehensive manner uh, for the larger, larger audience. And in order to present these ideas in a more comprehensive manner uh, for the larger audience, we had a difficult choice because a lot of papers came, just uh, about 19 uh, papers. And we had to cluster the papers into some dot themes. And, and these are, uh, in fact, placed in, as, as chapters. And we have uh, six chapters in introduction and chapter two, uh, the national emancipation of, of Bangladesh and then leadership of Bangladesh in chapter three. In chapter four, the foreign policy, uh, the ideals of Bangladesh under the dictum friendship towards all and malice towards none uh, by Bangabandhu. And then in chapter five, national building and development and in chapter six, conclusion. And each of the chapter incorporates one or more uh, papers from the distinguished scholars, both uh, from the old generation and new generation who illustrated the contribution of the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. In the uh, national emancipation, we have uh, the two, uh, chap uh, two the papers. The first one is the Bangabandhu uh, Diplomacy of Bangladesh Liberation, the Contextual Tales and Advent of Mujib, and Bangabandhu uh, and Bengali Nationalism. It's basically the, the background of, of Bangabandhu uh, in, in the, at, at the uh, liberation war. The, uh, and the Bengali nationalism, which worked uh, at, at the background of uh, the independence movement and liberation war of Bangladesh. And in the leadership part, we have the four fact papers. One is the iconic Bangabandhu leadership for then, now, and the future. And then Bangabandhu and Bangladesh, the rival leader of the oppressed, as already mentioned in the session, the Bangabandhu was uh, can be, in fact, represented as the iconic leader of the oppressed, not only in Bangladesh, but also for the world. And Bangabandhu in the global context, his leadership was in fact analyzed in, in the context of, of that uh, time of the world. And the fourth chapter is uh, on empowering nation through empowering women. So it's already discussed. And in this particular paper, you'll find, in fact, the thoughts of Bangabandhu is acts right after the independence, the recognition of, of the who are heroines and uh, daughters, and, and also the uh, empowerment uh, to uh, appointing them in different positions in, in the cabinet and also in different institutions as, as the heads. And also uh, his recognition of, of women as important, in fact, participants and workers in, in, in the first five-year plan. And in the foreign policy, there are uh, five papers one is Bangabandhu, the architect of the Bangladesh foreign policy, Bangabandhu and the roots of uh, Bangladesh foreign policy. And then balancing divergent uh, global powers. You all understand that the, that time was very turbulent and there are groups and, and, and polarization in the world. And one was led by the US and uh, the other was led by the USSR. So in that difficult period, Bangabandhu had a kind of neutral position and joining the NAM. And these all are in fact uh, covered in this uh, chapter. And then national building and development. So, and uh, in that part, there are uh, four, in, in fact, six papers. One of the Bangla Bangabandhu's economic philosophy, a brief review based on the unfinished, unfinished memoir. And then post war reconstruction, the huge effort was taken by Bangabandhu and uh, his administration to deconstruct uh, the war torn economy. And the transformation of economic policies and outcomes since Bangabandhu's time. And uh, since early 1970s, a lot of, in fact, initiatives, the reg regulations and in the promulgation of laws. So these are initiated and uh, the, in fact, book, this particular chapter, in fact, try to analyze this and how these, in fact, issues, the, the in fact, initiative of, of Bangabandhu, in fact, influence the 
subsequent developments of Bangladesh. And then from a dependency to trade annotation. So you all know that at that time, the economy was in fact war torn and the situation was not that rosy. And from that period, the lot of initiative was taken by Bangabandhu's administration. And then it was followed in the subsequent period and Bangladesh in fact transformed from aid dependent to trade dependent country. And then development trajectories and imperatives for vision 2040 on that time, uh, Bangabandhu had a mission to liberate the country, to in fact, to make the people free from poverty, inequality, and he had the mission to establish an egalitarian society. And now we have a vision, the vision 2041, which was placed by the uh, Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. So, and, and this was discussed in, in this particular chapter. And this book is basically collates and contextualizes its ideology, a political development vision and, and teachings uh, throughout the past, present and future. Basically, we in fact, uh, try to place it to the new generation of researchers, the scholars and students, so that they understand Bangabandhu, they understand Bangladesh. And that was our in fact endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mahfuz Kabir. Uh, may I now request the Honorable Foreign Minister to kindly formally launch the book on Bangabandhu. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Foreign Minister. Now it's time to listen to the Honorable Foreign Minister, His Excellency Dr. A.K. Abdul Momen MP. And may I now request him to address the webinar. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Dr. Shamsul, Professor Shamsul Alam, Honorable State Minister for Planning and Special Guest of today's event, Ambassador M. Fazlul Karim, Chairman of Bangladesh Institute of, International Institute of Strategic Studies, Major General Muhammad M. Dadul Bari, NDC PSC Director General of Base, Dr. Sayyad Anwar Hussain, Bangabundu Chair, uh, Professor of Bangladesh University of Professionals, Dr. Atiyud Rahman, Bangamundu Chair and Professor of the University of Dhaka, Distinguished Ambassadors, Guests, Professors, Ladies and Gentlemen, Peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum. I express my profound thanks to Bangladesh Institute of International Strategic Studies for inviting me at today's hybrid seminar titled Bangabundu and Bangladesh, an epic of nation's emergence and emancipation. I'm indeed privileged and humbled to join you all at this uh, August gathering. At the outset, uh, I would like to pay my deep respect to the father of the nation, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, whose charismatic leadership and long struggle helped us achieve our long cherished independence. In this month of mourning, I do recall with heavy heart the tragic event of 15th August 1975 and pay my deep 
deepest homage to the memories of those who were brutally killed along with the father of the nation on this fate, on that fateful night. Distinguished guest, uh, the month of August is the month of mourning for us. Uh, today's uh, discussion, from today's discussion, we truly learn a lot about how an independent nation state named Bangladesh emerged from the unwavering and undaunted leadership of the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. It is today's fascinating, fascinating for me to listen to the lessons of history from my friend uh, and classmate, Professor Sayyid Anwar Hussain, who is one of the two presenters at today's seminar. He depicted the role of Bangabandhu in cementing the Bengali nationhood and spearheaded the independence of Bangladesh. We have also heard from my young friend, former governor of Bangladesh Bank, Dr. Atu Rahman, who, uh, who had, had uh, dealt at length on the lifelong struggle and far-sighted leadership of Bangabandhu in emancipating the Bengali nation. Today, we have also listened to our special guest, uh, Professor State Minister, Professor Dr. Shamsul Alam, who has shared with us how Bangabandhu spearheaded the movement of political freedom and economic emancipation for the Bangladesh. I am deeply pleased to learn the valuable thoughts and insight and ideas of the distinguished speakers. I'm also happy to take part in the inauguration of the book with the same title in this seminar. It is heartening to see that, that, that think tanks like BIS has been encouraging research on the war of independence and the father of the nation. May I suggest BIS to publish write-ups on Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's achievement in resolving difficult issues with her neighbors, both India and Myanmar, to dialogue and discussion, and of course, legal processes without shooting a single bullet, proving her diplomatic maturity and achieving goals. Ladies and gentlemen, the title of today's seminar is very special and thus praiseworthy. There must not be any confusion on the fact that Bangladesh, Bengali nationhood, and Bangabandhu are inseparable. To illustrate, let me explain how the concept of Bengali nationhood got cemented under the able and unflinching leadership of Bangabandhu. The people of Didanish Pakistan, present day Bangladesh, long cherished an independent land to be politically democratic, culturally secular, and pluralistic, and economically, economically egalitarian. They long for such leadership capable of freeing, the, freeing them from the shackles of century-old subjugation and tyranny. The leader of the common people, Bangabundu, could easily sense the pulse of the masses. In 1947, when India was divided into two dominions based on religion, and East Pakistan was born, Bangabandhu the dream of a secular, egalitarian, and democratic government system for the people of Didanish Pakistan. Later, with the language movement from 1947 to 52, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib was, was proved correct as the Bengali nationalism on the issue of mother tongue clearly separated the people of Didanish Pakistan from the West Pakistan the two wings of Pakistan separated by around 1,200 miles apart. During 24 years living together with the United Pakistan, Bangabandhu not only realized the perpetuation of disparity and exploitation of East Pakistan by his Pakistani leadership. He led popular movements that reflect the popular aspirations of the exploited people of Didanish Pakistan. For example, his historic six point demands the Magna Carta of Bangladesh. The points were laid, were lucid, easy to comprehend, and most importantly, were the true reflection the feelings of Bengalis. His, uh, his party's uh, book, 
title Bangladesh Shoshan Kano. These are these are very clearly stated the reason for disaster situation in Leiden East Pakistan. It was for the first time when the Bengalis clamored for their economic and political rights and national security in the form of the demand for greater autonomy for East Pakistan. While the cementing the sense of Bengali nationhood among the people of then East Pakistan, Bangabandhu, as a part of his long-term vision, strive her to take his people gradually and systematically to the ultimate path of emancipation. Distinguished guest, to emancipate this Bengali nation, Bangandu has been in and out of the jail on numerous occasions, totaling more than 13 years of his prime life. And his family was in total jeopardy. Yet he never gave up. On the eve of 1970 general elections, he literally ran from one end of the country to another to extend his help and cooperation for the flood affected distressed people. He was truly a people's leader, which was largely reflected by the landslide victory of the army league, his, his political party. For example, his party army league won 167 parliamentary seats in the then East Pakistan out of 169 seats. Let me tell you at the time, the total number of parliamentary seats were 300 plus 13 for women reserves, totaling 370. Out of that army league, uh, Bangamundu's party got 54% votes, which is 167. And the other big party, the Pakistan, West Pakistan People's Party got uh, 81 plus five, which is around 27% of the votes. So, Bangamundu's party got 54% vote. In addition, there are other smaller parties like uh, and non-parties like independent 16 seats, Council of Muslim League, Convention Muslim League, Kayum Muslim League, all those. In addition, the NAP of uh, Frontier Province. These independent parties and other 36 of them also supported Bangabundu's government. But unfortunately, they then military junta in collaboration with the Pakistan's People's Party of Julfikar Ali Bhutto. You see, they denied Bangabandhu, uh, although he had the overwhelming majority of votes, but they denied Bangabandhu and his party to form a government. Postponed the parliamentary session that was supposed to seek on the 3rd of March. At this, the people, uh, people of the then East Pakistan rank and file, protested and demanded liberation of East Pakistan. On 7th March 1971, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Rahman, in his historic speech, laid down the roadmap for their struggle of independence and gave the Pakistani rulers last chance to honor the will of the people, the democracy. But unfortunately, on 25th March, instead of honoring the will of the people, the military junta let loose the genocide in which around 3 million people died. 10 million, including me, had to take shelter in neighboring India, and one third of nation's population were displaced from their homes. At this, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib, the leader of the majority party in Pakistan, was arrested. And just prior to his arrest, he left his clarion call for independence of Bangladesh. Ladies and gentlemen, though Bangamundu Sheikh Mujib was arrested and detained in jail in West Pakistan, Mujib's countrymen were unified under his leadership and instructions. Through nine months of struggle, fight and bloodshed, and at the cost of three million martyrs, Bangladesh was born on 16 December 1971. Bangabundu knew that the nation has achieved indomitable strength for achieving independence. He said, and I quote, as we have already learned how to sacrifice our own lives, now no one can stop us. Uh, even though we got the sovereign and independent land, 
we needed to march forward towards emancipating the nation economically. Then again, the greatest Bengali of all time, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, laid out the vision for building Shunar Bangla, a golden Bengal, and took initiatives to make this a reality. The guiding principle of Bangladesh, the constitution was written and adopted with the fundamental principles of Bengali nationalism, democracy, secularism, and socialism. In the Article 25th of the Bangladesh Constitution, the statement, friendship to all, malice towards none, was rolled out, which is still believed to be an exemplary philosophical stand in terms of foreign policy of any country. In the world torn apart with the deadly Cold War, threatened by nuclear weapons, Bangabandhu's position was always for the oppressed, freedom and peace-loving people. He declared his strong position against war and anything that disrupts global security, peace, and development. Bangabandhu declared, and I quote, the world is divided into two halves, the oppressed and the oppressors. I am with the oppressed, unquote. Distinguished guest, Bangabandhu once told, and I quote, I'll sacrifice my life if necessary to eliminate all injustice and exploitation from the country. And this is what exactly happened. It is very shameful and unfortunate for the nation that Bangabandhu was brutally killed in his own soil by his, by his very own countrymen. This tragic incident took place when Bangladesh started progressing towards the aspired vision of Shunar Bangla. Ladies and gentlemen, we are fortunate to have his able daughter, Sheikh Hasina, as the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. Under her very dynamic and pragmatic leadership, like her father, we are progressing fast on the path of achieving Shunar Bangla as dreamed by Bangabandhu. As I conclude in this month of national mourning, uh, national mourning, let us renew our commitment to the nation building efforts of our leader, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Let me remind ourselves a quote from Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore, and he says, and I quote, Udoer pote shunikar bani, ore bhoyanai, ore bhoyanai, nishya se pran je kori che dan khoyanai tar khoyanai. That is, if you sacrifice your life for the well-being of humanity, you will never die. You will remain eternal. No wonder. Bangamundu sacrificed his life and therefore he is ever living in us. Thank you all. Joy Bangla. Joy Bangabundu. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Foreign Minister, for your very inspiring and illuminating speech. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we indeed had a very stimulating discussion and dialogue on the life and contributions of the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Rahman. As the distinguished speakers and guests have highlighted, I feel that Bangabandhu was successful in his political life for a number of reasons. And firstly, he was from the grassroots, so he could feel the pulse of the nation very well. In the second place, he was always in touch with the masses. Whenever he could manage time, he would travel to the remotest areas of the country to see the condition of the people firsthand. In the third place, his self-sacrifice and devotion to the country and its people are well documented. Fourthly, his bravery and uncompromising attitude to uphold justice and fair play. And lastly, he had a plan and a vision to achieve an exploitation-free and prosperous Bangladesh. 
Bangabandhu loved his country and the people too much, as he once commented to an interviewer. And I quote, my greatest strength is my love for my people. And my greatest weakness is that I love them too much." Unquote. Bangabandhu's greatest success was the establishment of an independent country. He also dreamt of building a happy and prosperous Funar Bangla, for which we all need to work with diligence, honesty, and sincerity, and also be ready to make sacrifices. Bangabandhu had earned a place unsurpassed in the history of Bangladesh. And he is one of the most luminous stars of the world. He was and still is a beacon for the oppressed people of the world. Even today, people seek inspiration from his thoughts and policies in their struggles against injustice and repression. Ladies and gentlemen, before I conclude, I would like to thank our special guest, our chief guest, and the keynote speakers most sincerely for their valuable time and insightful presentations. I also thank all those who joined us today and shared their opinions and thoughts. I hope this webinar have helped us learn quite a lot about the various aspects of the life of Bangabandhu, his visions, his ideas and missions, and his contributions for the country as well as for the world. And I thank you all. Thank you very much.